It literally never fails. Every year in my living memory, Good Friday has the same exact weather. You wake up and it's cold, cold, kind of bleak, windy. It's not storming. You could go outside, but you don't want to. It's just kind of a miserable day. And then somewhere between the hours of one and three, the clouds part and the sun comes out and it warms up and it just looks beautiful for about 45 minutes. And then the clouds close in again and it goes back to the way it was. Every year on Good Friday, in the hours Jesus hung on the cross, and I have never seen an exception in my entire life, you get this little glimmer of hope that reminds us that when things look their worst, victory is about to break through. And exactly what had happened in the case of Jesus when everything looked like it was in the, in the tubes and people were running away, that's when the victory occurred. C.S. Lewis writes in some of his, uh, his writings that this happens in our life all the time. Just when you get to a point where you think you can't handle any more, you find a way to get through. You know, the pain grew and grew and you thought you were going to pass out and suddenly the tooth was out and, oh, and then you could leave the dentist's office. So many ways in our life that it just manages to break through at the last minute. So it is with God and his victory in his resurrection. So it will be with the church. If you are wondering why it seems like the church is still going on, why are we bothering anymore? Haven't we lost any? Aren't we just kind of stripped completely like Jesus on the cross, you know, stripped naked, nailed to a cross, can't go anywhere, totally at the mercy of everybody? Yeah, and that's when he beat evil definitively for all time. And it will happen with the Catholic Church as we are brought to our absolute low, lowest right now. We are just ready to spring forth with this new vivacity that comes out of nowhere that shocks people. And it shocks people in two ways. You see the response to this news that the tomb is now suddenly empty. You have those that run to the tomb, Mary Magdalene, the apostles, you know, they run there. And then you have some who aren't quite sure what to do about it all. And that's one of the characters we see in the road to Emmaus, the, the afternoon gospel of today. Uh, that that they, these two guys are walking away out of Jerusalem. Well, it looks like everything's over. I mean, the promises are obviously not coming true. We followed this guy. We thought he was different, but it's not. It's just another one of those empty promises like the infomercials on TV. You know, the thing doesn't do what it was advertised to do, and I'm going to throw it away now and go home. That's what they're doing. They're heading out. One of them, we are told, is named Cleophas. And I always remember Father Benedict Groeschel, who... Uh, I'd learned so much about the spiritual life from Father Benedict before he, he died at a, at a blessed old age. And uh, I remember being at a retreat at his place once and he was giving an Easter homily. And he said, when, if by the grace of God, I might attain to the kingdom of heaven, my first question for the Lord will be, who was Clopas? Was he the dry cleaner in the neighborhood or something? He grew up in New York City, New Jersey, so we actually, we don't know exactly who Clopas or Cleophas is, it's the same name, depending on how you transliterate it. Uh, there's a whole lot of theories out there, and some of them are very compelling. I did kind of a deep dive on this the last couple of days. But one thing we know for sure is that his wife was standing with Mary and Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross. We are told that Mary, the wife of Clopas, was standing there while the apostles were running away Cleophas's wife is standing right there and kind of with an arm around the two Marys watching it all happen and with total faith. He's the husband of a woman who stayed there to the end and he's not sure about it. How many of you here, men, are honestly in that situation? You've got a wife who is over the moon with the Catholic faith, you know, rosary in her hand all the time, goes to every single thing the church puts on, and you're just not sure that you can, <laughs> you can dive into it at that degree. Cleophas is your bro. Watch what happens to him in the story. As the resurrection happens, the apostles are spreading the news, but they haven't seen him yet, right? And he's saying, I mean, there's no hard evidence. I've got all these people talking about things, but we did a lot of talking before he died, and nothing really came of that, so I'm just going to go back to my old life. You know, This isn't going to change the way I see the world. 
And suddenly, you know the story, Jesus starts walking with them. They get to the town. He's given them all these Bible lessons along the way. And they say, hey, hey, look, you know, it's evening. Why don't you come in and have a meal with us? And he does. And he does something funny at the meal, right? He takes bread and breaks it and a cup, you know, and he basically has mass right there at the table. And as soon as he does that, he disappears from their sight. You know, the, the bread and wine just clunk right down on the table because there he is in the Holy Eucharist. He celebrates the Mass, and the true body and blood of Christ is made present, and he disappears. And seeing that, Cleophas suddenly understands why his wife is so, so crazy about all this stuff, and he goes running with his buddy straight back to Jerusalem to go and tell the apostles, we saw him, you guys haven't seen him yet, but we saw him, and by the time they get there, the apostles said, we saw him too, and this whole thing is true, and we've got the victory that he almost told us about. The Eucharist was the life-changing moment for Cleophas, and it can be so for you too. Every single Mass this is offered, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. It is our Passover. What do the Jewish people do and are still doing with the Passover lambs? They have the feast, they remember their slavery in Egypt, and then they take the blood of the lamb and they put it on the lintel of their doorway because that's what the Lord said. This is a reminder that you are my people and the evil will pass you by when it sees the blood on your doorway. St. John Chrysostom, preaching to a whole church full of new converts in 350 AD, is one of these great lectures to the, the neophytes of the church, like we had 20 people who received their sacraments came into the church last night right here. He was preaching to a church full of people like that. In 350 AD, we've been around forever, friends. We've been doing the same thing forever, fulfilling the promises of Jesus, and we'll keep on doing it until the end of time. And he says to these, to these new people, just like the Hebrews, after they eat the Passover lamb, they smear his blood on their doorpost and the angel passes over. If that was enough, the blood of an ordinary lamb to protect them, how much more will the devil himself fear to approach you when he sees not this figurative blood of the lamb, but the true blood of the lamb of God, Jesus Christ, smeared upon your lips the doorway to your soul? This is what we do. This is why Jesus is our Passover. We take the blood of the lamb and receiving it in Holy Eucharist, we, we, we smear our lips with that blood and it guards us against all evil. If you are saying at any point in your life, you know, things are going all right for me, but I just never seem to really, really attain what I'm going for. You know, I, I do all right, but I never achieve my goals. Or, or maybe you've got a big challenge that's ahead of you, of whatever it is, physical, spiritual, in the workplace, uh, the social, you know, you've got a friendship that's falling apart and you want to save it. And you just think, I just need another gear to get up this hill. This is your gear, friends, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, which he shared with Cleophas at the table in the village of Emmaus and changed his life and sent him running back to Jerusalem. I offer you this, friends, and I encourage you to take advantage. I, I often say to people, when I lift up the Eucharist right before communion and I say, behold the Lamb of God, what I am saying is, take one of these once a week and it will fix everything. Over time, it doesn't work in two weeks, friends. You've got to give it time to build up. Just like if you reach for the oil when the bearings start to squeak, it's already too late. You've got to be doing it routine maintenance week after week. You do that, you will start to see a change in your life. You will feel that extra gear kick in. This is the time, friends. Everything has changed in these parishes now. We are not the same parish we were a year ago at this time. We're a family of parishes. New people are coming in. Nobody is even going to think twice if you suddenly pop back in here and start going to Mass every week. It'll just flow and you will feel that power of God flowing through you from his body and blood and you will run to the cross of Christ, to the empty tomb and feel its power fixing everything in your life. Please stand as we renew our baptism